Well, first of all, I want to thank uh, Julio and Mark for their observations that set some of the scientific context for the topic that we're discussing here tonight. And we felt that that was particularly important because, as I think both their presentations have illustrated quite nicely, there's been a rather significant evolution in the science of HIV and what we know about uh, how to prevent HIV transmission and what works. And one of the key things that we keep trying to insist upon uh, in the legal sphere as the number of cases of people being prosecuted for allegedly not disclosing their HIV status uh, increases is that the law also needs to evolve. The law needs to evolve to take into account the evolution in the science. And so my task here tonight, before we get into uh, more of the, the debate, is to lay out for you in, I hope, what are relatively simple terms, the state of the law and of prosecutions for HIV non-disclosure in Canada. Here's a graph, and I apologize for those of you at the back of the room who might not be able to make out all of the slides that are up at the front of the room here, but this graph uh, illustrates the number of criminal prosecutions for alleged non-disclosure of HIV status uh, that we're aware of, and it probably uh, under-reports a bit the actual number because there are not, we don't necessarily know of all of the cases if they don't come to our attention in one way or another. Uh, but it is a reasonably accurate tally because I think we, we have reasonably good uh, feelers out there and we, I think we capture most of them. Uh, this is the number of cases from 1989 uh, until the end of February 2011. And what I want to just uh, highlight specifically for you is uh, that just around the time in the late 90s when we're seeing the tremendous breakthroughs with highly active antiretroviral therapy and starting to see the evidence emerging that in fact treatment with heart uh, dramatically has a dramatic prevention impact, uh, we're also seeing a, the beginning of a significant and sustained jump in the number of criminal prosecutions for uh, HIV non-disclosure. And that follows a Supreme Court of Canada decision in 1998 that a good number of you in the room I'm sure will have heard of and that is the Courier decision. It was the first case that made its way to the Supreme Court of Canada on this issue. And a number of organizations, including the HIV AIDS Legal Network, uh, intervened before the court at that time to raise a number of public policy considerations, urging the court to actually limit the scope of the application of the criminal law. Um, we were, uh, I would not say, hugely successful at the time with those arguments, but I think the one thing that I will come back to in a moment that was the most significant uh, achievement, if you will, of that intervention was to get the court to say something about the legal significance of condom use and what it might mean for the application of the criminal law. But the point I want to make here is that in 1998, the Supreme Court confirmed for the first time that, in fact, it is possible to obtain a conviction for uh, assault, and in particular, in that case, the charge was aggravated assault, uh, against a person who is HIV positive and does not disclose that fact to a sexual partner. Um, in what circumstances, of course, is the key question or set of questions, and I'm going to elaborate on that in a moment. But since the Supreme Court of Canada decided that in 1998, we've seen a significant increase in the number of cases um, in the post-1998 period. You'll see from that time on that each year uh, the number of cases, uh, almost with, without exception, has been higher than in the pre-1998 period. And in particular, um, as a sort of sub-point, you'll see that from about 2003 on, in fact, we've seen a, another sort of jump in the number of prosecutions per year. Uh, but 1998, I think, was sort of the key turning point. So the key things to understand about the criminal law, and I'm going to unpack this a little bit more in a moment, is that in Canada at this time, a person who's living with HIV can be prosecuted for not disclosing his or her HIV positive status before engaging in an activity that poses a significant risk of transmitting HIV. That's the key phrase, significant risk. And really everything, uh, almost everything, has been turning on what that phrase means since the Supreme Court of Canada set this as its approach for dealing with this question. I want to underline, um, because this is often a point of confusion, that in fact, uh, because it's a risk-based approach to applying the criminal law, people can be and have been uh, prosecuted and are convicted uh, even if no actual transmission of the virus to a sexual partner happens. So it's about the risk of transmission, not actual transmission. So how does the court get to this uh, application of the law? 
and what does that then mean for how the law gets interpreted in subsequent cases. So very briefly, a quick uh, tour uh, for those of you in the room who are not lawyers and who aren't familiar with this through the relevant sections of the criminal code, um, which I've boiled down to the key parts. The key thing to start with is, is an understanding of how, what an assault is under criminal law in Canada. An assault occurs when someone applies physical force, i.e. contact, to another person intentionally uh, and does so without that person's consent. So the two uh, key provisions of the criminal code uh, are put here on the screen, but the key thing to understand is physical contact without consent. And consent does not exist for legal purposes uh, in a number of circumstances. One of those circumstances is if your partner's consent to sex is obtained by fraud. And this was the heart of the Supreme Court of Canada's decision in 1998, because they had to decide, well, is there a fraud when it comes to not disclosing one's HIV positive status to a sexual partner? Uh, and if so, then there's no consent to the sex, therefore we have an assault, or if uh, as we commonly see now, a sexual assault. Um, just <clears throat> for people to understand, uh, there are different levels of seriousness of assault in the criminal code. The most serious uh, level of assault is an aggravated assault, and that's not just a simple assault, it's an assault which has the consequence of endangering the life of the person who's been assaulted, and that carries a maximum penalty of 14 years in prison. Um, there are heightened penalties for when we're talking about uh, sexual assault. So there's a series of provisions on assault uh, leading up to aggravated assault. There's a parallel series of provisions on sexual assault. And at the high end of that, we have aggravated sexual assault, which is basically endangering the life of a complainant in the course of committing a sexual assault. And because we're primarily talking about uh, cases of non-disclosure to a sexual partner here, the offense that is normally laid, or the charge that is normally laid against people is aggravated sexual assault the maximum penalty for which upon conviction is life imprisonment. So these are some of the most serious offenses in the criminal code, and I think that's an important point to underline. So in this case, the Supreme Court of Canada said, um, we have to decide whether or not uh, not disclosing your HIV positive status to a sexual partner uh, meets the definition in law of being a fraud, in which case there's an assault. And they, this is the thing that the court struggled with in the Courier judgment. In fact, they struggled with it so much that there are three separate judgments. The court split quite seriously on how this question was to be addressed. Uh, the majority judgment, which of course is the controlling one, um, at least for now, uh, is, uh, came to the conclusion that there has to be a significant risk of causing serious bodily harm if there is such a significant risk, then there is a duty to disclose the thing that poses that risk. They were very clear to say that absent such a risk, then there is no duty to disclose. The duty would not arise. They wanted to set this standard because they were concerned about not trivializing the law of assault. At the extreme end, as they pointed out, if we're going to accept that anything that's dishonest, that's, that's a fraud, uh, could render otherwise consensual sex an assault were to be the test, then it would become a sexual assault if you were to lie about your marital status, for example. And if the other person would not have had sex with you if they knew you were married, then that becomes a sexual assault. And they said that's taking the criminal law too far. They used that as an example at the far end of the spectrum. So they wanted to come up with something that was a more objective, harm-based test. And so they said this is the threshold, a significant risk of harm. The prosecution also has to show that there's a link between not disclosing this thing that poses a significant risk of harm and the fact that the person consented to have sex with you. Now that's not usually a difficult thing for the prosecution to show in most cases. It usually means calling the complainant to the stand who will say, of course I never would have had sex with him or her had I known that he or she was HIV positive. And that's the sort of proof that's, that's necessary for that. So really mostly what it turns on is What's the evidence here of a significant risk of HIV transmission? And I want to talk briefly about four scenarios that have come up in the case law and uh, some of which are actually headed to the Supreme Court of Canada. The first of those is the question of unprotected anal or vaginal sex. Um, as we've heard, this is, the, this is at the higher end of the spectrum of uh, risk of transmission, and this was in fact the fact pattern that was before the Supreme Court of Canada in the Courier case, 
Uh, it was an HIV positive man who was accused of having not disclosed his status before having unprotected vaginal sex on a number of occasions with two female partners. And uh, this was the context in which the court articulated this test of a significant risk of transmission is what triggers the duty to disclose. And they said, as a matter of law, it's possible for you to obtain a conviction in this sort of circumstance. So that seemed to fairly clearly establish that unprotected anal or vaginal sex would meet this threshold of a significant risk of transmission. More recent developments have started to call that into question and take a somewhat more nuanced approach. And there was a case here that we'll, I expect, uh, hear a little bit more detail about uh, perhaps later, um, in which a trial judge acquitted a gay man who had HIV uh, in circumstances where there were allegations uh, accepted as proven by the court of unprotected anal sex on, on three occasions in which he was the receptive partner. And in that case, based on the medical evidence before her, the trial judge found that there was a cumulative risk of 0.12% of transmission. And she concluded that this was not significant for the purposes of the criminal law of assault. And so therefore, not disclosing was uh, not sufficient grounds for conviction, and he was acquitted. So it may be more complicated, actually, than we might have thought from the original Supreme Court of Canada judgment. Uh, the second issue I want to touch on is the question of condom use. And this was the one, as I said before, where I think we managed to achieve something through the intervention before the Supreme Court in Courier. The majority of the court, four out of the seven judges who sat on the, on the case, who adopted this significant risk test, uh, said that the careful use of condoms might be found to reduce the risk of harm, that is, of transmission, enough so that it could no longer be considered significant. And if it's not significant, then there's no duty to disclose that you have HIV. So a majority of the court uh, suggested that this might be, that condom use might basically preclude uh, criminal prosecution uh, for not disclosing your status. In a concurring judgment that approached the question from a somewhat different perspective, um, two of the other judges actually said very clearly, they went further and said, if you use a condom, if you have protected sex, then this is not going to be something that the criminal code is going to catch. It has to be unprotected sex before the criminal code is going to step in. So six out of the seven judges either said explicitly or uh, suggested that condom use could suffice. But the majority didn't rule on it definitively, and so we've been left with this question for, for all the years since, is condom use good enough to avoid being prosecuted for not disclosing? If you look at the cases that have followed uh, the Supreme Court of Canada judgment, uh, most of them are in favor of this suggestion. They take up this suggestion from the Supreme Court and say, uh, in one way or another, that condoms are sufficient and you do not need to disclose your status if you've used a condom. Some of them have said that quite explicitly. Others have said it implicitly by saying the prosecution has to prove that the sex was unprotected in order to get a conviction. Um, and more recently, we've seen uh, Court of Appeal from Manitoba judgment that uh, explicitly corrected a lower court when the lower court said a condom use alone does not suffice. Um, and the court said, and actually, that's not correct. A condom alone would suffice. Uh, and that case has now been appealed further by the Crown in Manitoba to the Supreme Court of Canada. And at the moment, it's scheduled to be heard in early 2012. So I think we can't say with 100% certainty that the law is settled on this point. Uh, and certainly there are uh, prosecutors in some place who um, are seeking convictions even where condoms have been used. But I'd say the very significant bulk of the case law since the Supreme Court of Canada's decision does accept that condoms should suffice. Um, in our hoped for intervention before the Supreme Court of Canada in this next case to get there, we certainly will be making that argument before the court, uh, as it was accepted in the Court of Appeal below. What about oral sex? Um, th things are less clear here, just because there have been fewer cases, at least uh, reported and that we know of, uh, on the matter of oral sex uh, specifically, which you know, isn't entirely surprising. There was an early case from the Nova Scotia Supreme Court in 2001 in which both the Crown prosecutor and the judge actually agreed that uh, unprotected oral sex uh, was low risk. This is oral sex performed on an HIV positive man was a low risk for transmission and this wouldn't meet the test of significant risk and so couldn't sustain a prosecution for aggravated assault. Um, however, more recently in Ontario, there was a conviction by a jury of a man uh, based on some allegations of unprotected oral sex. Uh, 
Now, this was a rather infamous case in Ontario, and there were a number of complainants. There were other activities involved with other uh, women that the accused had had sex with, some of whom were infected. Um, and so I, I'm not sure that too much weight can be placed on this jury uh, verdict in this case, because I suspect that what happened from having read the transcripts is that this just got lumped in with a bunch of other more egregious uh, behavior that the jury took exception to. So I, I'm not sure it stands for much of a precedent, but it's worrisome nonetheless, because I think it illustrates the potential for um, unsophisticated thinking about these issues and potential miscarriages of justice. In another Ontario case, the prosecution eventually uh, stayed some charges where the only allegation had been that an HIV positive man had performed, not received, but had performed oral sex on his partner. And he was charged with aggravated sexual assault and for more than a year, those charges were out there and he was going through the criminal process until the Crown ultimately stayed the charges. But I think it illustrates the danger of not having clarity in the law because you get this kind of inconsistent application of the law uh, that may depend in part on where you happen to uh, get in trouble. And then finally, I want to touch on the question of reduced viral load that's already been mentioned by uh, Julio and Mark. There was mention of the Swiss statement and uh, there was mention made of the fact that the Swiss statement about the impact of uh, antiretroviral treatment and undetectable viral load basically rendering people non-infectious, that was the wording used by the Swiss experts under some certain conditions, uh, basically led a prosecutor in Switzerland to actually appeal a conviction. That doesn't happen very often. But the prosecutor said, well, we shouldn't be convicting people for hypothetical risks. And so uh, the prosecutor actually took the initiative to appeal to the Court of Appeal and get the conviction overturned. Now, this issue has come up in a number of cases before appellate courts in Canada and is coming up before a number of trial courts and is before a case that is going before the Supreme Court of Canada, uh, again, at the moment in early 2012. There was a case that went to the BC Court of Appeal here where the Court of Appeal um, wasn't willing to articulate a specific risk threshold and, and clarify uh, in numerical terms, this is what significant risk does and does not include, but they did accept that the viral load of the accused person was highly relevant, that was their language, to assessing whether there was a significant risk of transmission. And then two subsequent cases, one in the Manitoba Court of Appeal and one at the Quebec Court of Appeal, have both accepted that if a person has an undetectable viral load, with the accompanying risk reduction, uh, then it was sufficient to find that this person did not pose a significant risk of transmission, and so they could not be convicted for not disclosing their status. The Crown has appealed in both of those cases, and that issue will be before the Supreme Court of Canada, and I don't think we can say that it's settled at this point in Canadian law. So let me just uh, then wrap up by noting something that Madam Justice Beverly McLaughlin, uh, who is now the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Canada, said in her reasons in the Courier case, the first time the Supreme Court uh, pronounced on this issue, she took issue with this significant risk of serious uh, harm test that the majority had adopted uh, because she was concerned about it being potentially overbroad and potentially unfair. Um, her primary concern and why she said we should draw a bright line test and say condoms suffice, we're not going to prosecute people when they use condoms, was that there was too much uncertainty and vagueness in just accepting significant risk without actually saying what that means. And she said, when is a risk significant enough to qualify conduct as criminal? In whose eyes is significance to be determined? The victims, the accused, or the judges? Um, she said the criminal law must be certain. If it's uncertain, it cannot deter inappropriate conduct and it loses its raison d'etre. Equally serious, it becomes unfair. And I think those words were actually prescient because what we've seen since the Supreme Court issued its judgment in Courier is that in fact we've, we've seen this inconsistency in the interpretation and the application of the law. We've got people being prosecuted and or convicted for things in one jurisdiction uh, for which they've been acquitted in other jurisdictions. So it seems to me that this is a fairly, our experience since the Supreme Court of Canada's first decision is a fairly compelling case for why we need some greater certainty, but not just certainty, we need fairness in the law. And this is why we've wanted to bring some of the scientific evidence to court and say, in your understanding of the significant risk, risk test, you need to have regard to the evolution in the science. Because we can have a clear rule, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's an acceptable rule. It could be an entirely unfair rule. And if we want to make this rule fair, and you're saying that it's the risk of harm that is of concern here, then let's actually look at the science if we're going to have to assess risk. So let me leave you with that thought. <clears throat>
and steer you to uh, some resources that are available on our website. Uh, you can find more information about them at the back of the room. These are resources for lawyers and other advocates on this issue that steer you to some of the key cases that I mentioned and to some of the key scientific studies that some of the previous speakers have mentioned. Thanks very much. <laughs>